Welcome to Red Dwarf Season 6! After Red Dwarf USA failed, the creators returned to the original show. Of course, after five seasons, it had begun to stagnate a bit, so once again, changes were made. Again, major costume changes like in Season 3, but they didn't stop there. They almost rebooted it in a way and treated it as a good jumping on point for anyone who is seeing the show for the first time. Who the hell are you? So Lister has been in some kind of deep sleep for 200 years and has woken up with amnesia. You have been out for over 200 years. Well, I tried to wake you up in the spring, but you absolutely insisted on another three months. Then he finds out that he is someone whose favorite breakfast is cornflakes with onions and a glass of chilled vindaloo sauce. That's like some barely human grossed out slime ball. Oh, it's all flooding back, is it, sir? And now we're reminded of Kachansky because she's gradually going to become important again. You dated her once for three weeks before she discarded you for a catering officer. Relationship upgrade retcon confirmed. He also can't play the guitar. Sir, as soon as your personality is fully restored, you will firmly believe you can play the guitar like the ghost of Hendrix. That is actually going to come up again in this episode. Is there something good you can tell me about myself? You sometimes help me out with my laundry duties by turning your underpants inside out and extending the wear time by three weeks. There are actually plenty of good things about Lister, but of course they don't come up because rule of funny. What's that? That's Mr. Rimmer, sir. This is his light bee. In any case, I guess Rimmer's light bee was being kept in the freezer and now it has to be reheated? That's odd. Downloading physical form. Wait, Rimmer could have been a Tyrannosaurus Rex? <laughs> Actually, why are all of those things hologram options anyway? Load charisma. <laughs> Load neuroses. That's our Rimmer. So now Rimmer has been downloaded and now Lister's memories start coming back. Oh, that Rimmer. <laughs> Anyway, in a meeting a bit later, it's revealed that they have lost Red Dwarf. This is obviously the major change I was talking about earlier. That's a pretty bold move, removing the title character from the show. They could have renamed it to Starbug. Apparently Lister parked it on a blue-green planetoid and then forgot which one it was. Not the same as little blue-green planetoids. Blue-green and planetoidy. Though Crichton thinks it was stolen. Who would steal a gigantic red trash can with no brakes and three million years on the clock? But that they have a good chance of getting it back now, but it'll involve maneuvering through an asteroid belt. Crichton, you're forgetting about Space Tour Directive 1742. No member of the Corps should ever report for duty in a ginger toupee. Oh, here come the Space Corps directives again. 1743, then. Oh, I see. No registered vessel should attempt to transverse an asteroid belt without deflectors. Yes, God, he's pedantic. Also, Cat is now officially a pilot. There's an old cat proverb. It's better to live one hour as a tiger than a whole lifetime as a worm. There's an old human proverb. Who ever heard of a worm skin rug? That exchange was a holdover from Red Dwarf USA. There's an old cat proverb. It says it's better to live an hour as a tiger than a lifetime as a worm. There's an old human saying. Who ever heard of a worm skin rug? Also, cat can somehow smell when things are coming. Something's coming. Nothing on the nav account. I can smell it. Something big. There's a meteor bigger than King Kong's first dump of the day. And it's steaming straight towards us. Stay classy, Rimmer. Face it, we're deader than corduroy. So apparently they can use the waste disposal unit as a cannon, and Crichton plans to launch a ball of garbage laced with nitroglycerin at the oncoming meteor. Pretty resourceful. Ready, Crichton? Fire! And it works. Go, guys. Check out your screens! Afterwards, they come across a ship. And then more. I'm getting them too. Ten. No, twelve. Old derelict. Until they're in a spaceship graveyard. I recommend we stop engines and launch Scouter. Engine stop, Scouter launched. <laughs> I guess Crichton has gotten a promotion and is now allowed to command launching the Scouter. I, Mr. Crichton, am the one who says launch Scouter. So the Scouter enters a ship and finds a message written on the floor in blood and viscera. P. S. I. R. E. N. S. Sirens. Uh, who would do that? Someone who badly needed a pen. What I don't understand is why he went to the trouble of using his kidney as a full stop. I wonder why they bothered with the pee. I mean, I know these aren't exactly the sirens from Greek mythology, but if you're bleeding to death, are you really going to take the time to make the distinction? So now they're going to watch the black box recording. Oh my god, you're beautiful. I can't resist you. Get that straw out of my ear! And it was a little too much for Rimmer. I can't blame him. Aside from the straw, that was pretty disturbing. This entire belt is swarming with some kind of genetically engineered life form. So anyway, they figured out by the recording, along with a few others that the scouter collected, that these are Gelfs called Sirens, who use some sort of mind powers to alter your perception. 
kind of like Camille from season four, but their intentions are a lot more malevolent. They trick you into landing your ship on one of the asteroids, suck out your brains, and steal whatever they can from your ship. Well, they shouldn't bother us then, there's barely a snack on board. Since they're in a race against time, since they don't want Red Dwarf to get too far away, they have to stay on track and they decide that they are just going to have to resist the siren's call. Incoming message! And here's their first attempt. If we are to survive, we need males to spread their seed amongst our number. You heard him. They want seed spreaders. I'm gonna apply. <laughs> Call me paranoid, but you don't think they would eat siren dude things, do you? We have to give him some credit. If this were an earlier season, the rest of the crew would have had to physically hold him back. Had we not been here to stop him, he would now be on one of those asteroids, crawling around without a brain, trying to write, Oh boy, was I suckered with his own intestinal tract. And here's attempt number two. This is Captain Tao, the SCS Pioneer. We're under attack. Captain Tao, I think that's also the name of the Red Dwarf Captain in Red Dwarf USA. Don't try to help us. And oh look, Kachansky is with her. By the way, I think this might be the last appearance of Claire Grogan as Kachansky. I've been keeping back three bullets. One for me, one each for the two kids. Kids? Jim, Bexley, come to mommy. So Lister has two sons named Jim and Bexley in two different timelines? That's confusing. Tune into Sanity FM. Or he would if this wasn't just the sirens tricking him. Of course, it's as plain as a Bulgarian pinup. So now there's suddenly a giant flaming meteorite headed right for them. There's nothing on the radar. So, I think it's another illusion. Or maybe not. Relax, gentlemen, you're quite safe. And it turns out Crichton was right. Ah, smug mode. But now there's another one and they can't tell if it's real or not, though Rimmer insists that it's not. We do not need to enlist the help of a domestic droid with a head shaped like a genetically flawed lumpfish. Okay, keep your hate on. Keep your hate on. What if the fireball is real and this time the radar readout's the illusion? Gentlemen, relax. We're quite safe. So of course this one was real and Starbug crashes again. This old baby's crashed more times than a ZX-81. Lister has to go outside to dig out Starbug. I guess now we're finally seeing the intended use of the bazookoids. Makes sense. Lister is about to go back inside when... Hi, Dave. Suddenly he's not alone. You chose a sister. Remember me, Dave. I love how he doesn't know her name and only ever refers to her as Pete Trans's sister. Stay back, Pete Trans's sister. I know what you want. Stay back, Pete Trans's sister. Oh, I can't resist you anymore, Pete Trans's sister. He knows it's not really her, but he can't resist. <laughs> so much ew. Fun fact, this scene involved a whole lot of KY jelly. You can buy it in buckets, apparently. Crichton rescues him. Come on, Dave. But his calling Lister Dave clues us into it being another siren. I'm starting the engines. Get back in here now! On me way. So it takes a while, but Lister gets back into Starbug. But one of the view screens shows Lister also being outside. I'm afraid, sir, you're already here. They don't want to let a siren on board, but there's a 50% chance that they already have one, and they can't risk losing Lister, so both Listers are let on board. He's the siren, and I'm me. This is easily the best split screen effect they've ever done on this show. So they run a few tests to figure out which one is the real Lister, while Cat stands by with a bazookoid. Play the guitar. If you look really closely, you can tell that those aren't Craig Charles' arms. They hide it pretty well, though. I didn't pick up on it until it was pointed out in the documentary. Craig Charles can play the guitar, just not this well. <laughs> in any case, Cat blows him away, since obviously that's not Lister. That's the way you believe you can play, sir. That's why when the siren read your mind, he shared your delusion that you are not a ten-thumb, tone-deaf, talentless noise polluter. That's inconsistent with the one disguised as Crichton calling him Dave earlier, but oh well. <laughs> See, what's the difference? A little survival tip, bud. Never play your guitar in front of a man with a loaded gun. But the siren wasn't dead and it got away while they were distracted. Meteor storm off a starboard bow, it's a biggie. So Crichton and Rimmer are going after the siren while Lister and Cat man the cockpit. Excellent in all but one small detail. I think you know what it is. Bye. Correction, only Crichton is going after the siren. This feels a bit like aliens to me. Please. There is no logic in trying to engage me in combat. So Crichton is confronted by the siren, but claims that it can't do anything to him. My creator? Hello, Crichton. Holy crap, it's Jenny Agutter. 
Apparently it's fairly common for well-known British actors to show up on Red Dwarf, but this is the only one that I've recognized right off the bat. In retrospect, I probably should have recognized Craig Ferguson in Confidence and Paranoia, but the tan and American accent threw me. Plus, I hadn't seen him in anything in a long time. I'm guessing Jenny Agutter is probably a lot more well-known in the UK. I mostly know her from an American werewolf in London and Child's Play 2. Gotta love the boots they put her in. What is the function of this illusion? You cannot harm me. It's coded into every cell in your body. Anyway, it's true that Crichton cannot be seduced and doesn't have an organic brain, so the siren disguises itself as Crichton's creator and convinces him to get into the trash compactor. You are sick! Sick, but actually pretty clever. The meteor storm was another illusion. The siren's not as badly injured as we thought. The rest of the crew shows up and finds Crichton missing. Rimmer's battery goes out, leaving only Lister and Cat left. They find a vending machine, a vending machine dude, in the engine room. but it turns out to be a siren who promptly knocks them out and gets its straw ready. <laughs> Meanwhile, Crichton is released from the trash compactor. The look on his face says it all. I'm almost annoyed. <laughs> he sees that the siren is just below him, trying to decide whether to eat Lister's or Cat's brain first. And it meets a pretty undignified death by Crichton Cube. Speaking of Crichton Cube, in the meantime, he makes a pretty good table. Besides, the cat has invited me to join him in the weekly crap game tonight. <laughs> He's gonna be the dice. Approaching Nebula. Well, let's see what's in there. And so ends Sirens. This is a great episode, even if it takes a little while to really get going. I feel the need to point out the change in costumes this time around, since the series got such a big overhaul. Lister is now wearing a boiler suit, which is going to be a staple for a while. His clothing has always been pretty utilitarian, but this look is even more so. Rimmer's costume has remained almost the same for the last three seasons, with mainly only the color changing, but now it's gotten an overhaul as well. It's now a waist-length jacket with padded shoulders. Apparently Chris Berry didn't really care for it, but I think it flatters him. The color is still red, but that'll change soon. Of course, I'll talk more about cats in the next cat video, but it's probably going to be a much shorter segment than the earlier ones because his number of outfits has been greatly reduced, and they all involve the same base. Crichton's costume also got an overhaul because poor Robert Llewellyn couldn't sit down in the old one. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think it looks as good since there's so much fabric now. It looks less robotic and more like someone in a costume, but oh well. And of course, now they're in Starbug instead of Red Dwarf, which allows for a lot more exploration since instead of killing time until they eventually get back to Earth, they are now chasing Red Dwarf. Also, the Starbug set is obviously a lot smaller than the Red Dwarf set was, so that allows for more sets and therefore more locations. Season 6 is going to be all over the place in the best ways possible. As for this episode, we get a pretty cool enemy in concept and appearance, despite the straw. I guess they didn't want it to be too threatening, so they added that one bit of silliness. Either way, it's based off of a stag beetle. And of course, as mentioned by Lister, it's based on the concept of sirens from Greek mythology, who looked like gorgeous women, sometimes depicted as bird-like or mermaid-like, who sat on the shore and lured men to their deaths. Probably as an allegory about getting distracted from your goals. The Sirens in Red Dwarf send messages to lure them out of Starbug. That's a pretty interesting way to reference how Sirens in Greek mythology lured their victims with song. This is one of those episodes that I caught before I really got into the series myself. I walked in while my husband was watching it, and Crichton waddling around as a giant cube with that indignant look on his face was one of the funniest things I'd ever seen. I guess that's about all I have to say about this episode. There isn't a whole lot to analyze, it's mostly just a lot of fun and action. Which is fine, it gets season 6 off to a great start. Next up is Legion, see you then. Like with Ulysses and that ancient Turkish legend. I believe the legend was Greek, sir. Whatever, some country big on Kaylee shoes and humus.